fact that Mr. R felt secure enough to, and supported enough, to denounce him to the monarch, I mean, it just really showed his true place in the pecking order. And it really just showed Harry that nobody cared about him, nobody loved him, and that he was really on his own. In that dark cave of a dwelling that they just sort of shuffled him off to. Good morning, how are you? So good to see you this morning. And it's nice to be back to our regular scheduled programming. Last week was kind of jacked up. Anyway, uh, happy Tuesday morning. This episode, I am happy to say, is full of all sorts of interesting stories. And when I say interesting, I mean a lot of complaining, but we're out of Afghanistan. So as you can imagine, I'm thrilled. Um, but if I had to give this section a theme, it would be he is a marginalized individual in his own family. Okay, you need to know before going in here that the royal family only likes people who are married. And since Harry isn't, they go out of their way to make him feel like a loser and give him the worst scraps of anything that's left. So everybody else gets all the perks and privileges, which by the way, he doesn't actually mind, okay? So like, just, you need to know that, okay? It totally sucks that everyone gets everything except for him, but he, it, he's cool with it. He's cool with it. So just know that he's okay with it, even though it stinks, but he's fine. <laughs> he, he's fine. Okay. Just believe, believe that. Okay. He's fine. Even though he has nothing but a badger set to live in, even though everybody gets everything but him. <laughs> He's chill, super chill, <laughs> love and life. I mean, it's lonely and degrading because everyone gets everything. And he is never invited over for dinner at William's house. And you know, um, him and his girlfriend aren't doing very well and, and he's really lonely and it's like really dark where he lives and, and like there's not enough light and, and the guy upstairs is really mean and somebody's parking in his mom's parking spot, but, but he's fine, he's fine just trying to get those panic attacks under control. But other than that, so anyway, this section is, he is going back and forth. Like in the same paragraph, he's like, I'm good, except I'm falling apart, but I'm good. I'm good. I mean, like we can add some more uh, labels to his mental state if you want to. I mean, this guy is, you want to talk about somebody who's oscillating. This guy's personality is oscillating from north to south, from east to west, from happy to sad. You've never seen anything like it. Okay, so let's just get right into this. Um, two things I have to say before we start. Obviously, my obligatory. Please like, subscribe, share. You know, that whole thing. Uh, if you're enjoying it, share with a friend. Hit that subscribe button. You know, all that. Uh, you know. Um, but the other thing that I have to say is, okay. I mocked Harry soundly for saying aircon. And as it turns out, I am the loser. Because everyone else says that but me. <laughs> everyone in the comments is like, oh, that's a term. And I was like, oh, sorry. <laughs> so, um, Harry, I would like to uh, issue an apology for making fun of the fact that you said aircon. And I was wrong. And everyone let me know that. Will you forgive me? No, you're part of the problem. Anyway, um... So to anybody who I may have inadvertently offended by making fun of Harry and one, of, one more of his little abbreviated short-term words, um, I'm sorry. I, I now accept that globally, aircon is a term for air conditioning. So thank you for letting me know. Uh, okay, um, now to the book, to this chapter of Spare. We start off with a real banger, by the way. Um, a story that I'm just like, that's an interesting story. This whole section, by the way, it's just like a bunch of random stories. They're very, very loosely tied together, if at all. It's like, you can just see that he probably handed his ghostwriter a bunch of papers and was like, could you do something with this? I mean, some of them aren't even stories. Look, this is a list of things in his apartment. Is my toaster oven on there? No, am 
I ever going to turn this into a book? Well, just shape them, change them. You're a writer. Yes. I'm a writer. So we start out with one of the most random stories of the entire book. He says that at this time, he was really struggling with his mental health. And he was really struggling with panic attacks and PTSD from Afghanistan. So, um, and like one of the things that he just was really struggling with is like these heat attacks. He would just like be drenched in sweat all of a sudden. And just that, I mean, it was just killing him. Well, one night when he was sitting in his room, he was sitting in, he was at Clarence's house at this time. He was sitting in the TV room. He just finished watching like episode after episode after episode of Friends. He decided to call a friend. And he calls Thomas, who was Henner's brother. Now we remember Henner. Henner was his friend from school, very close. Henner's was uh, killed in a car accident. And it was kind of a freak accident because Henner wasn't even going that fast. Anyway, he died. So um, Harry was still really good friends with Thomas, Henner's brother. So he called Thomas, see what Thomas was doing. Thomas had just left a restaurant and was walking home. And he was happy to have somebody to talk to on his way home. And it was just a random conversation filled with one thing and another. A lot of remembrances. They talked about Mummy. They talked about how she was just like a teenage boy because she'd have these burping contests with them. And, you know, it was just one thing and another, but, you know, reminiscing about Henner's, you know, talking about this or that. Thomas was going through a hard time in his life personally. Harry tells us that he was going through a divorce and other personal things. I don't know why he told us that maybe just to say hey we're both in a hard time so we were there for each other like that's kind of the big emphasis on this like what a good friend he is what a good friend he is to call Thomas um and so maybe that's the point of the story because he goes on to say that he's on the phone with him and then suddenly he hears Thomas screaming and carrying on and he's like trying to like figure out what's happening and then he like puts two and two together and he's like being mugged so he runs down the hall to the police room tells them about it they jump in the car him and his police people and his bodyguards and stuff there he is thrown to the side of the street and now harry gets to come and be the good samaritan to pull his friend up out of the ditch and he's like thomas kept thanking me so much you know saying i was such a good friend i mean that's what friends do you know they rescue you when you're being mugged I'm just glad I could be there with my team of policemen and bodyguards. Just felt really good to be a good friend. And I mean, that's the kind of person I am though. So like, I'm not gonna like listen to my friend get mugged and like hang up and just hope it's okay. Cause I mean, I am a good friend. Loyal is what you'd call me. And that would be the word for it. You know, loyalty, fidelity, love. So after he gets done telling us about that, then he gets he goes on to talk about how he'd been living with Pa for ages. Like he's 28 now and still living with Pa at Clarence's house. God, that place is the worst. And so it's time for him to move out. Now it seems to me that like he's all the time crying that he lives with Pa, but I, get a place to stay then. Who says you have to live with Pa? Is it like a royal rule that you gotta live with your dad? No, it's not. Here's the thing. When he and William were at school learning how to fly helicopters, remember how William was just like, hey, I need somewhere to stay. And he, you know, got himself a little cottage to live in. So it seems that it's, presumably it's possible for a person to find somewhere to stay and then make the arrangements to stay there. Anyway, Harry, because everybody has to do everything for him, he just, has been waiting, I guess, for somebody to arrange his own private quarters. Well, finally someone got around to doing it. And he says that um, he had been given a place. He'd been assigned his own flat um, and on KP's lower ground floor, Kensington Palace. But he wants to know, he wants you to know that like the lower floor means that like it was basically a basement dwelling, okay? Like half of it was underground. So like big whoop, he has his own place now, but it's a complete and total trash heap. And he says that the flat had three tall windows, but they admitted little light. So the differences between dawn, dusk, and midday were nominal at best. By the way, what is the deal? with these royal people whining about their quarters. I remember seeing Fergie on TV, like, you know, no shade to Fergie, but 
she was on Oprah and she was talking about when she lived at Buckingham Palace and what a total heat that place was. And how it was so dark all the time and the light bulbs were dim and it was like you, the wattage of the bulbs had to be a certain amount so they're not like drawing too much electricity but it meant that she lived in the dark half her life and I mean okay I it just seems like it's, it's, it's a little like low class to be complaining about your your rent free lodgings you know I mean I don't know I do like a lot of natural light myself so I guess I can see that it would be discouraging but if you don't like it then find your own place like you can't make arrangements like there's nobody to talk to and be like you know what I'm kind of in a really hard place right now like with my mental health and living in a place that's really dark and um just not well lit it's, it's not contributing to like me feeling like I can get my day started and all this okay like you know that is a little bit whiny get some lamps or something but at the same time they're like all the courtiers, all the palaces there to like aid you in your lifestyle. Seems like you could say something or like have just, you know, have some initiative. You don't like where you're living? You're a big boy. You've been to war. You can't find an apartment. That doesn't make any sense. Okay. So he is like complaining, complaining, complaining. But he says one of the biggest problems was the stupid neighbors who lived upstairs were the worst mr and mrs r mr r drove this big gray discovery that he would park right in front of the few windows harry had disrespectful you know they're blocking out that little bit of light he has so he wrote a very nice note to mr r and he said to mr r could you please not park your big discovery right in front of my windows i've only got so much light and <laughs> Mr. R, according to Harry, fired back a reply telling me to suck eggs. And then he went to Granny and asked her to tell me the same. <laughs> what? <laughs> All I did was ask you to please move your van. Um, and he said that Granny never told him about it. So then I'm like, well, how do you know about it then? Granny apparently never told him about it. But the fact that Mr. R felt secure enough to and supported enough to denounce him to the monarch. I mean, it just really showed his true place in the pecking order. And it really just showed Harry that nobody cared about him, nobody loved him, and that he was really on his own in that dark cave of a dwelling that they just sort of shuffled him off to. But then he says, after all of this whining about how dark it was and how the neighbors were terrible, he goes, I should fight, I told myself. I should confront the man face to face. But I figured, no. The flat actually suited my mood. Darkness at noon suited my mood. Well, then why are you telling us a story? If you're like totally A-OK -okay with the darkness of the dwelling because your mood was so dark and it all fit together, then why are you telling us a story about how awful it was for you? Literally, it's terrible. And then it's fine. Well, is it or isn't it? <laughs> What's going on, Harry? Don't you know your own mind? Well, he goes on. One of his classic non-committal fact statements. He goes, I invited a maid over one day. He said the flat reminded him of a badger set. Or maybe I said that to him. I don't know. Either way, it was true. I, I, but I didn't mind. What is this line about either I said it or he did? I mean, I don't know. Whatever. But anyway, I don't care. Editor, you need to get a red pen. He, the editor, I mean, why did they let so so many of these statements? Uh, this, that, whatever, I don't know. We're going to hit another one in a, just a little bit. If you don't remember, it doesn't go in the book. Okay, so um, he says one time, so the, the friend who came over who might, might or might not have said that the place was a badger said, um, says he, they're sitting there one day. He's got the windows open, the few little windows he's got, and a little light out into the world. He's got them cracked open. It's a nice day out. And then suddenly, what should he see at the windows? There's a sheet being lowered down. And the sheet's being shaken. And what's that? What's that coming off the sheet? Oh, no. Mrs. R has been cutting everybody's hair upstairs and she's shaking the sheet out and the entire house is being filled with human hair. So he goes on and on about like 
was unbelievable. Mrs. R was giving a trim to one of her sons and shaking out the sheet in which she collected the clippings. And the real problem, however, was that my three windows were open. It was a breezy day and gusts of fine hair blew into the flat. My mate and I coughed and laughed and picked strands out of our tongues. What didn't come into the flat landed like summer rain on the shared garden, which just then was blooming with mint and rosemary. Okay, having cut my own son's hair multiple times, all their lives, one child getting a haircut would not fill an apartment with hair and cover the garden. What is a child, a Yeti? How in the world is this much hair coming off a little kid? BS. I'm not saying it's inconvenient that somebody's hair is flying in your apartment. That's unfortunate. But she, I mean, I mean, he goes on to say, you know, she couldn't have known that his windows were open. But that didn't stop him from spending days composing an ugly note to Mrs. R in his head. But the real problem, he admits, now y'all buckle up for this. The real problem that he had with Mrs. R actually had nothing to do with the fact that she filled his apartment with you know, the nasty child's hair. The real problem was that she parked her car in Mummy's old spot. And it was just such a knife in the heart every time he saw her car parked where Mummy's green BMW used to be. It was wrong for me, he says, and I knew it was wrong but on some level I condemned Mrs. R for it. Somebody help me, what are these senseless sources of resentment? What, what, what is, what is this? Okay, so after complaining about the neighbors, complaining about his badger set apartment, which by the way, he was totally fine with, okay? It was a rank, stank place to live, but whatever, you know? In the end, you know, it's fine fine that that's all anyone would give him. After he gets done complaining about that, then he goes on to talk about how jealous he was of William Kate, except he doesn't say that, but it's dripping on every word. He says that meanwhile, while living in the Badger set with Mr. and Mrs. R raining hair down on him and blocking his windows with their car, he'd become an uncle. Willie and Kate, as he calls them, had welcomed their first child, George, and George was a beautiful child and he was looking forward to being an uncle to George, also looking forward to giving George a little bit of advice about how to live in this fishbowl. Please don't. Um, then he says that one of the things that was so painful about George being born is the reporters. Those always asking him such nosy questions and now they wanted to know how he felt about no longer being the the heir to the throne you know the spare anyway that now his line in the succession had just been bumped he'd been bumped back down again how did he feel about that and the truth was he couldn't care less you guys couldn't care less you know he was delighted just delighted for William and Kate and you know, the thing is, is that if he was unhappy, had nothing to do with them, their little kid, okay? It wasn't anything like that. It's just that, you know, life was just like really bad all the time, okay? It had nothing to do with that. I mean, he was lonely and miserable and didn't have any kids or a wife or anything, but it didn't have anything to do with William's happiness. So, you know, stop making suggestions. Well, since he's got nothing to do, he decides that um, maybe he needs to think about how to celebrate his birthday. Um, going down to the South Pole sounds great. Since the last time he was at one of the poles, he froze his private up. But now he decides that, you know, he's just got to do something to sort of knock him out of this terrible rut he's in. Because he's just feeling bad all the time. And one of the things he feels the worst about is the fact that Pod just doesn't seem to get how sad he is and isn't taking any responsibility for the fact that his poor parenting is what landed him in this place in the first place. So he finally decides to tell Pa that he's really having problems with panic attacks and anxiety. And would that Pa would care, you know? So Pa's like, oh, that sounds really bad. Let me set you up with a doctor. Okay, so, you know, since Harry has already established that he cannot call a medical professional, Pa swoops in like a father and says, let me make you a doctor's appointment, which he then does. So if Pa can do it, why can't Harry? But whatever. Um, 
But Pa didn't know anything about the right doctor to call. He's just a general practitioner. What was he going to do with that? That joker didn't know anything. And, you know, all he wanted to do was just slam a bunch of pills down Harry's throat. No, okay. On the one hand, I understand Harry's dilemma. Okay, I don't want to just mock him because I think we've all had times when we've gone to the doctor and just feel like we aren't really listened to or our problems aren't necessarily considered in a way that we would like to be considered by the medical establishment. It is usually, just take this medicine, you know. So that's, I... I, I will not call BS on the fact that when he went to the general practitioner, they were just like, why don't we put you on some anxiety medication? That's usually their answer. And he wanted some homeopathic remedies. Okay, that's fine. It's his health. He can do what he wants to do. So one of the things that he was, that was suggested to him by um, another medical professional was that he should start taking magnesium if he didn't want to take any sort of, you know, pill, then he could maybe start taking some supplements. But the magnesium gave him explosive diarrhea, which was unfortunate because he found that out at a wedding. Oh, the knees are toilet, the knees are toilet! Oh, God, the knees are toilet! Oh, oh, oh. No. Oh, oh, oh. No, Megan. No! No! Look away! <laughs> Megan, no! Look away! Oh. <laughs> um. Anyway, having stalled on the medical front, getting some real help, he decided that what he needed to do was just hammer Pa about the fact that his problems really stemmed from Pa's inability to understand him as a human being. He said one night he sat Pa down and just regaled him with stories about how terrible he was feeling and all the times Pa had abandoned him and left him to his own devices. And he says that by the end of this absolute badgering session, Pa says softly, I suppose it was my fault. I should have got you help, the help that you needed years ago. <sighs> Poor Charles. Um, now that Harry finally feels that he's amply manipulated his father, then he decides to go in for this generous statement. I'd assured him that it, it wasn't his fault, but I appreciated the apology. Didn't you just spend all evening trying to convince him that it was, and now that he finally gets it, now you're going to generously allow him to um, feel the cathartic uh, understanding that, oh, it's not really his fault. Now you're going to be the savior and provide the catharsis now that you've made him feel abundantly bad for such being such a bad parent. How very generous of you. But the thing is, he's grown now. So when is he going to decide that his sadness isn't everybody else's burden? If he thinks that he should have received counseling or whatever it was that he thinks he should have received post mommy, mommy's death slash disappearance. Um, okay, that's one thing. Although, as we've all stated many is the time, how many of us believe he didn't receive some help? Not very many of us. Um, but now that he is 28, 29, you just can't keep blaming everybody else for, the, for, for, for feeling bad. At some point, you've got to decide, hey, I feel like trash all the time, but what am I going to do to take the reins in my own defense against this? Like, what am I going to do to combat these negative feelings that seem to just be overtaking me? Maybe I need to go and find, a, you know, a suitable mental health professional who can help me. Same as the fact that if I'm feeling really poorly, I can't wait for somebody else to find me a doctor and then complain about who they find. Find your own doctor, do some research. Because apparently he had no problem sitting there Googling all night about his symptoms. He says that, he would Google all night about his panic attack symptoms. Google a doctor. If you're that worried about it, you'd go to a doctor. But it seems to me like he just wants to sit in the negative feelings, like it does something for him to feel bad. Like it makes him feel alive. So rather than go to a doctor, which is what you would do if you were really worried about it, he just sits there and feels bad all day. Okay. Um, then he goes on a long jag about the fact that he's not married and that makes him a lesser citizen of the family. He's a lesser member of the family because he does not have a bride by his side. You know, William, Catherine, they're just living high off the hog. And by the way, he doesn't really care about all the perks they get. It's just that it's disrespectful. He doesn't get it. Okay. It's, it's not a matter of caring. It's a matter of common decency. He says that, you know, you really became somebody in the family once you were married. It's what made you legitimate. 
And because he wasn't, he's just getting the scraps of everybody's attention. You know, he, he just doesn't have a place. He says that as soon as William got married, um, they became the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge. They got real titles. Um, they became a household. And now they were entitled to more staff and more cars and bigger home and a grander office and extra resources and engraved letterheads. And he absolutely didn't care about the perks. It's not about that for me. It's not about that at all, okay? I don't mind that I have to live like a pauper. My whole life is like living like a proletariat in a badger set. It's just a matter of common decency and respect. And that's why I'm concerned about, I'm concerned about the moral implications of all these people who aren't giving me the respect. I'm, I'm worried about their souls is what I'm worried about. Anyway, so like I said, his birthday's coming up, so he's gotta do something to mark this occasion. And that sound, it sounds to him like it's time to go to the South Pole. After the issues that he had in the North Pole, it's just as wild to me that he'd go like, let me go do that again. Hmm. Spilling all over the place. Let me go do that again. You know, then he goes, <laughs> he wants to let you know that he did learn his lesson about the appendage problem, okay? Back to that again. Oh my gosh. Did the contract have some kind of line in it that said, you need to talk about your manhood this many times in the book or we won't publish it? I mean, it's like, he's like saying this, like he's like checking stuff off of the box. Like, oh, got to get that mandatory thing in about my uh, todger. Can't forget that part. I mean, how many more do I have to do? Oh, okay. I got to, I got to talk about it six more times. Okay. Uh, okay. Um... Let me talk about the special underwear that I had made for when I went to the South Pole, okay? You needed special underwear? Aren't you wearing pants? How did that even happen in the first place? I would love for somebody to have asked him, hey, you remember that part in the book where you said that you like got frostbite? Um, how did that happen? Did you remember to put your pants on that morning and your underwear? Or did you just walk out in the snow with his bare butt? It's not even possible. Okay, so he's, he wants to let you know that he's like, People warned me that the South Pole was even colder than the North. I laughed. How could that even be possible? Well, you know, when the sun doesn't shine there hardly ever. I'd already frozen my penis, mate. Wasn't that the very definition of the worst case scenario? Also, this time, I'd know how to take proper precautions. Snugger underwear, more padding, etc. Better yet, one very close mate hired a seamstress to make me a bespoke cock cushion. Square, supportive. It was sewn from pieces of the softest fleece and, uh, <laughs> well, enough said. Enough said, if only, if only it was enough said. Weirdo. Um, he takes a break from talking about his preparations for the South Pole expedition to tell you that he has a new private secretary. This private secretary's name is Ed Lane Fox, but they call him Elf for short, because you know, ELF. And he says that he often reminded people of Willie, but it's probably just because he was bald, like William, his arch nemesis. Um, and ELF, Elf, was quite a doer. And he suggested that what Harry needed to do to get his warrior games off the ground, they haven't named it yet, but you know, it's going to be the answer to the American warrior games, what he needs to do is hire Sir Keith Mills, who had organized the Olympics in London, and that was a smash success. So get that guy on board. Well, Elf arranges a meeting, and it was hard convincing. Sir Keith wanted to retire. You know, he wasn't into this idea of working for Harry and Harry's warrior games. And after Harry goes on and on and on about it, and he asks the guy, would you do it? The guy's like, well, you know, I mean, I, I'm trying to retire, so I'm not really into any big projects right now. In fact, tomorrow I'm going on vacation, so. And Harry's like, I mean, come on, don't you want to be involved in this? It's, it's, a, it's a worthy cause. And the guy says that, all right, well, who else do you have on, on the project? And Harry's got, you know, this salesman pitch line. That's the beauty of it. You get to be the first one. So the guy's like, but they do actually manage to convince him to be involved. Um, so happy day on that. Good, good gumdrops. 
Then he starts talking about his time in the South Pole. You know, guys, he, okay. He says when they get there, there's this little tiny village and it's got these little porta cabins. And he says that it was amazing there. They fed him so well. The chicken noodle soup is out of this world, by the way, in the South Pole, in case you ever get, find time to get down there. They really know how to make some soup. And he says that um, it was just a, the strangest place because it was all white and there was no sounds and there was no smells and it was just this blank whiteness. And there was nothing you could, there was nothing to see except for like some giant fuel barrels. And he thought that this might be a really good place for him to sort of like wipe the hard drive of his mind, like really, you know, start fresh, hit the reset button here in this white place where everything is just blank. So he says that <clears throat> they get going, um, they flew to the starting point of the track. And as they began walking, he says, as we began walking at last, I remembered, oh yeah, my toe's broken. What? Just recently, in fact, a boys weekend in Norfolk, we drank and smoked, party till dawn. And then, while trying to reassemble one of the rooms that we'd rearranged, I dropped a heavy chair with brass wheels onto my foot. <laughs> Silly injury, but debilitating. I could barely walk. No matter. I was determined not to let the team down. How very generous of you, considering that once again, you're walking with people who are severe amputees. One guy doesn't even have any legs, so we don't want to hear about your toe. Um, he talks about how he had been advised by an experienced polar guide to clean the hard drive, as we have discussed and that the nothingness of the place would put him into a trance in which he could sort of sort himself out. And he says it did. Well, you can imagine you're walking, 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 and there's nothing to look at. Pretty sure your mind probably does go into a bit of a trance-like state. But the problem was, is that as he was trying to soldier on with his broken toe, um, then he started to get the dizzies, the dizzies. And he says that the South Pole counterintuitively is high above sea level roughly 3,000 meters, and so altitude sickness is a real danger. One walker had already been taken off our trek, and now I understood why. The feeling started slowly, and I brushed it off. Then it knocked me flat. Head spins, followed by crushing migraine, pressure building on both lobes of my brain. I didn't want to stop, but it wasn't up to me. My body said, thanks, this is where we get off. The knees went, and the upper torso followed. Down I went. Looked a right fool. He says that the medics pitched a tent, laid him flat, gave him some kind of anti-migraine injection in the butt, he thinks. Steroids, I heard them say. And then I came to and I felt semi-revived and I caught up with the group and I searched for a way back into the trance. Be the cold, be the snow. As we neared the pole, we were all in sync, all elated. We could see it there, just over there, through the, our ice-crusted eyelashes. We began running to it. Stop! So they, they're so close, but apparently you're not allowed to camp at the South Pole, not at the exact location. So they got to camp and then in the morning they'll go. And he says that when they got there, there's a circle of flags right around where the pole is. He says, we stood before the flags exhausted, relieved, disoriented. Why is there Union Jack on the coffin? He says as a complete and total aside to that, once again, Every time he sees the flag, he thinks about mummy. It's always mummy, always mummy. It's just like, can't you ever just be in a moment? I thought you just wiped the hard drive. I guess you didn't do a very good job of it. And he says that, uh, here's another one of his, you know, non-committal fact statements. Some press accounts say one of the soldiers took off his leg. We used it as a tankard to guzzle champagne, which sounds right, but I can't remember. And my immediate thought was, you can't remember drinking champagne out of somebody's leg? But then he goes on to say, I've drunk booze out of multiple prosthetic legs in my life and I can't swear that this is one of the times. <laughs> His normal is just not mine. Okay, um, 
I feel like if I ever drank champagne out of somebody's leg, I'd remember it, but I guess I'm not living the life of the rich and famous in which we just take off our prosthetic legs and drink ourselves silly. Okay, now uh, he finishes up there um, with a final complaint about the fact that uh, there's a research station built by the Americans. The building is just god-awful ugly. Um, of course, they would have to muck it up, those silly yanks. And he says that there was a huge cafe, but when they got there, the cafe was closed and they offered him nothing but a glass of water. So the whole thing was just real deflating, you know. Would have been nice if he could have sat down to a feast after having gotten to the South Pole, but all those Americans could offer him was a glass of water in their ugly research building. Disappointments. Then he says, uh, now that he's back from the South Pole, he wants to complain about his accommodations again. Okay, because he's not ready. He's not, he's not about to stop beating that dead horse. He says that it was Christmas. Everyone is at Sandringham. And the whole place was full. You know, all the family was there. Which meant that his accommodations were rank. You know where they put him? He says that he got a mini room in a narrow back corridor among the offices of the palace staff. He'd never even been to that part of the place. He didn't even know that place existed. Now, mind you, okay, he wants to let you know that he was. I mean, it was kind of interesting to be in a part of the place he'd never been in before. You know, I mean. Now, I like the notion of seeing and exploring uncharted territory. I was a grizzled polar explorer, after all. But I also felt a bit unappreciated and a bit unloved. Relegated to the hinderlands. And he says he told himself to make the best of it. But I told myself, make the best of it. Don't let these horrid people wreck the serenity that you've developed in the South Pole. Remember, your hard drive is clean. Don't let them muck it up. So he says that, you know, one of the problems with being, every, being with everybody in the family is that these jokers they were all just so competitive. And one of the biggest problems was having to see all these losers who bragged all the time and documented things in the court circular about all their royal work that, by the way, wasn't even that big of a deal and not even worth mentioning. But they were over there all just trying to, you know, make their ledgers longer of all the hours that they'd worked. Now, he was of, a, of an integrity unmatched. And he would never self-report stuff that he had done just to get a higher number of hours in the court circular. But there was a lot of people at this Christmas who were just competitive, self-consumed narcissists who had to have their name at the top of the list. And you know, they would report things that he and William would never even deign to report. Things like flying via helicopter to go cut a ribbon at a horse farm. I mean, what is that? Who would even report that? So embarrassing that they'd even bother. He said certain family members had become obsessed, feverishly striving to have the highest number of official engagements. And, you know, the important thing for you to know is that, you know, he just wasn't that competitive. He wasn't competitive. And as a consequence, he was just better than them because of his level of integrity. No, not to get into that kind of petty tit for tat. You know, I mean, he knew his worth. He knew what he'd been up to. He didn't have to, you know, self-report a bunch of stupid stuff. But it's just hard being at Christmas with a bunch of people like this. You know, they just made life so difficult. You know, at one point he just had to excuse himself and go back to his room and suck down this tube of air that he'd gotten from the South Pole as a souvenir. You know, he would just go and back to his room and look at pictures on the iPad of him in the South Pole and, you know, just try to relive that. Try to just regain some of his sanity. I mean, it was, it was a slog though, you know, because Christmas with those guys was just a nightmare. But good news, he gets to move out of the Badger set. <laughs> Yay! So he got to move into Nottingham Cottage, AKA not caught. And William and Kate had been there before, it had been their house. So, I mean, it's hand-me-down, unfortunately, but they'd outgrown it. So now they got Aunt Margaret's old place. 
but it's right across the way. So they can like do stuff together. And he and Cress are still together. So let's take, like, let's do like some double dating. <laughs> Unfortunately, all of the things that he had imagined, like getting to pop in and be fun Uncle Harry with toys under one arm and, you know, a bottle of wine in the other, being asked to supper and all these little cozy family gatherings. It's just, it didn't happen. It just didn't happen the way he'd imagined it. In fact, they were so consumed with their life and their baby and you know, all the renovations because there was constant renovations going on, constantly. They didn't even ask him to come over and eat. Nobody ever said anything to him about it. Okay, Harry, well, you know what? You just got a new place and you're not doing any renovations. Why don't you have them over to supper? What about that wild idea? Okay, nobody is tearing your kitchen apart, so why don't you have them over for something to eat? Why does it always have to be everybody else making the overtures for him? He's just, you know, relegated to the fringe of society all the time. Hey, well, why don't you edge in? If you want a relationship with your brother and your sister-in-law and the new baby, ask them over, you know? It's not like you even have to be the one to cook the food. I'm sure there's somebody cooking the food for you. So it's not like a big burden or anything. Anyway, he's just super... Ugh. The twisted knife. William always just trying to make him feel bad. Then he goes on after he, you know, lets you... After he's made sure that you're aware of the situation with him and William right now, that now that William is just consumed with his family. He goes on to talk about how... Um, He's still suffering from panic attacks. And he said that he was supposed to go and give a talk at this place called We Day, where there was 14,000 young faces looking up at him and he's like mid panic attack trying to give a speech. And he says, maybe I'd have been less nervous if I'd concentrated more on them, but I was having a proper me day, thinking about the last time I'd given a speech under this roof, 10th anniversary of mommy's death. Oh, this is the one time he's having a me day. Okay, well, it's an every day me day. Okay, so he's flipping out because the last time he was here, mummy, he was talking about mummy or not talking about mummy. I think that was the time when he said he should have said something, but he didn't. Um, anyway, Cress is there to support him. And when he takes his seat, you know, his face is white and flabby and flushed and hot. Cress is like, are you okay? And he's like, yeah, 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 but he wasn't. And he says that for two years, they'd been secretly dating. And it was just wonder of wonder, miracle of miracles because the paps hadn't found out. So they were totally able to enjoy each other without those, you know, without the nuisance of constantly being attacked. Anyway, it was at that event that the paparazzi finally figured out that they were a couple. And so the gig was up, but they'd been together for two years. So it kind of helped that they had this foundation and that they were committed to each other. And he goes on to tell us that she was really unique when it came to the women that he had dated because she was the first one, the only one, to ask him about mummy. <laughs> but this is the thing, I'm like, okay, you're gonna tell me that Chelsea never once spoke to you about your mom? Maybe she didn't, but that sounds like a pretty shallow relationship that you would never, ever speak about that. I just don't believe it. But anyway, I think it was the way she asked him that that's what stood up in his mind. He says that when they had been on a skiing trip before, skiing meant a lot to them. It was sacred to them, symbolic, really. Um, he said that one night when they were on the slopes, they're having a really fun time. They were at his cousin's chalet. And he says that they, it was in, at night, you know, they had a busy day. She's washing her face in the bathroom, taking off her makeup, brushing her teeth, and he's sitting on the edge of the tub. And it was in this perfection, that this little intimate, cozy, normal evening, talking about nothing special, she took that opportunity to ask him about his mother. Unique, a girlfriend asking about my mother. But it was also the way she asked. Her tone was just the right blend of curiosity and compassion. The way she reacted to my answer was just right too. Surprised, concerned, no judgment. He says maybe it was all the factors coming together and this, you know, alchemy of physical fatigue and Swiss hospitality that made him 
suddenly tear up and suddenly he was crying and he remembers thinking oh i'm crying but what is this salty discharge and him saying to her this is the first time i've and christina leaning forward saying what do you mean first time this is the first time i've been able to cry about my mom since since the burial anyway he wiped her eyes and she was the first person to help him come across that barrier first time he could unleash the tears and you just wonder now if he can ever stop crying it's like one of those things where people like don't cry don't cry don't cry and then once they start crying it's just like they're a new person and all they do is weep the sad thing was is that here they had this beautiful time on the ski trip and so when he later on the relationship when they tried to relive this special moment um, skiing because you know clearly that was something there was something about skiing that really helped them as a couple um when he went with her um lo and behold on this next trip he found out that he actually didn't like her at all um just sometime during that ski trip he realized they weren't a match now you guys we have gotten bukus of details about everything that we don't want to know about he has given us ample to discuss. Yet now we're coming up to one of the reasons why he's breaking up with the girl who helped him to access his emotions. And he gives us no reasons for why he did it. He just keeps being like, we just weren't a match. We just weren't a match. We just weren't a match. You've been with the girl for two years. I, this, this isn't the time to dry up now. Tell us why, what happened? He doesn't. He just says that you know, it just wasn't meant to be. And when the trip was over, he called one of his friends and was like, you know what, <laughs> I hate that girl. And his friend was like, well, better tell her now, sooner now than, better now than later. So he trundles on over to her house and um, he tells her, you know, I just don't think this is gonna work. And this is what he writes. She nodded, none of it seemed to surprise her. These things had been on her mind as well. I've learned so much from you, Cress. She nodded, looked at the floor, tears running down her cheeks. Damn, I thought. She helped me cry, and now I'm leaving her in tears. End of that story. <laughs> How lovely and sensitive of you. Um, and this is our final story. And we're gonna end it on the same note we've been playing on this entire section. Everybody gets to be happy, but Harry. He finishes up this section by saying that his best mate, Guy, was getting married. And Guy was getting married in Tennessee. So he got to go to the Deep South. And he says that, once again, he's a little worried and trepidatious about showing up in America because, you know, those Americans really, they put a spell on him and he just takes his clothes off. He's a little bit worried about it, but he manages to pull it together, get to Tennessee. Of course, they have to take the obligatory tour of Graceland. And they go to Elvis Presley's house. And of course, we've got to have the whole passage about, man, that place is a dump. What? Okay, here's the thing. Graceland is a dump. But it's like, is anybody surprised? Look at the man who owned the place. I mean, some of those pictures of him at later dates, I mean, would we have expected him to live anywhere else? Anyway, he says that it was real dark and claustrophobic, kind of like that badger said he'd been forced to stay in. And, um, you know, funny little thing that the bridal party did was everyone wore blue suede shoes in honor of Elvis. And he said that the reception was real great. Everyone had a lovely time. But the thing that really stunk was that, when was it gonna be his turn? That's all he could think about all night. When was it gonna be his turn? One person who might want it the most. The one person who wanted a family, one person who wanted to be married was him. He wanted it more than anybody at that place, probably even more than the bride and groom. There he was alone, like always. When was it gonna be his turn to be happy? And that's where we end today. Oh, this section was just so very typical of Harry. This entire book. I just want to know, did he ever read it back and just think, the tone of this is a little off. You know, because most memoirs are written to um, reminisce about what, what happened 
to consider what happened. Like I have, ne I love memoirs. It's one of the reasons I want to start this channel is I wanted to review memoirs, which I think things have taken a different turn because of the topic that we, that I started off with. And you know, now people want royal news, which is fine. We can talk about that too. But I love memoirs and most memoirs are very contemplative, not just about the things that happened to them, but their role in it. Um, I've just never read a memoir that is just so one-sided and 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 so um, completely devoid of self-reflection. That's nothing new. I mean, I, I think I've said that every single time. Like, where's it self-reflection? But it's just interesting to me. Like, this is the taste he wants to leave in our mouths. This is who he wants us to think he is. And I guess it's just, I mean, it's just evidence of how long he sat with the feelings because they're very normal to him. Like the rest of us are reading this thinking, wow, this is, the tone of this is really unfortunate. But he's so accustomed to feeling this way that it's not strange to him. It doesn't feel off-putting. It doesn't feel um, rude. It doesn't feel uh, self-involved. It feels like his right to say this. And this is the problem with our society. This is the last thing I'll say and then I'll close it up because I think this video is gonna be like an hour long. We live in a society that tells you, you have these rights. It is your right. What, whatever happens, you do you. You, it, it, you get to be happy. Doesn't matter, whatever you need to do, whatever blinders you need to put on in order for you to be happy, you do that thing. And the problem with that is that you can crush a lot of people in your pursuit of happiness. I, you know, the, the people who are like, oh, you know, I, I need these things in my life to be happy. So I need to step on these people in order for that to be accomplished. Are you really happy on the other side of that? When you've burned bridges, when you've, when you've destroyed people's lives, when you've treated people like dirt, all in pursuit of what was going to make you feel fulfilled? I think the question to ask yourself is why would my happiness have to come at the expense of everybody else's? Why, does his, why is his happiness, why does that matter more than his father's happiness, his brother's happiness, the happiness of the English people? Why, why, does, why is his truth and his reality and his rights, why, do, why are they worth more? I, I don't know, but I think he's such a product of the current, um, of the current psychology that it doesn't matter what, it doesn't matter, doesn't matter. You just do you and doing you is super destructive and highly irresponsible because very rarely does doing you all the time mean you're taking care of the people around you. It's got nothing to do with treating people the way you want to be treated. And I mean, Harry has very clearly made himself his own God, you know, and so he's constantly worshiping at the altar of himself. But when you are stuck with yourself as the God and there's no higher power that you are responsible to, you're going to make a lot of sorry mistakes and you're going to treat people really poorly because none of them are going to worship you the way you worship yourself. So they're always going to be sinning against you. They're always going to be sinning against this God that you are. Anyway, that's just my take on what's going on with him. But anyway, um, this is a long video. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.